Chip Drive, and we're hoping to get more listeners to join the ranks of WHYY. We have a goal of 100 pledges this hour. Last hour we did hit our goal, but we have a new one now, and feeling pretty good about it. If you believe in WHYY and shows like Morning Edition, show us today by pledging your support at WHYY.org or 1-888-345-9499. And you may have heard yesterday us asking for your support to bring in an extra $40,000 uh, from the Gussick Stein Charitable Trust if we reached 1,000 pledges yesterday by 6. Well, we didn't quite make it. But we are very fortunate that Gussick Stein Charitable Trust has extended their offer till 10 o'clock this morning. So now, um, with your help, we will reach this $1,000, uh, 1,000 pledges rather, and be able to bring in this extra $40,000 on top of your generous pledge. So please give at whyy.org, or you can call 888-345-9499. Be generous. Uh, do it this morning. Thanks. And NPR News in Washington. I'm Dave Mattingly. A House Intelligence Committee memo could be released as early as today. The four-page classified document was put together by Republicans on the panel. It alleges surveillance abuses by the FBI and the Justice Department in the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential race. The top Democrat on the committee, California's Adam Schiff, is accusing the committee's chairman of altering the document after the vote was taken on whether to release it. Here's NPR Scott Newman. In a letter to Chairman Devin Nunes, the leading Democrat on the committee, accused Republicans of making unspecified material changes before sending the memo to the White House for review. Schiff says Democrats weren't even aware of the changes, let alone given a chance to review or approve them. Republicans say they're only minor edits. The FBI also says it has grave concerns about the memo's accuracy. The chairman of Turkey's Amnesty International chapter remains in custody. NPR's Peter Kenyon says that's despite a court order that he be released. Tanner Kelich was ordered released Wednesday by an Istanbul court. He's the only one of ten civil society activists charged with terror-related offenses still in custody. Amnesty says Kelich's family was disappointed to see him transferred from prison to the gendarmes instead of being released. An appeals court is expected to consider his status. I'm Dave Mattingly, NPR News, in Washington. And you're listening to Morning Edition. I am Bobby Allen here with Naomi Strobin. We are hoping to bring more members on board to hit our goal of 100. And we have a special announcement to make, which is for every pledge WHYY receives today, the station will be feeding the bird. What bird, you ask? The bird. An American bald eagle or other bird of prey being taken care of by the American Eagle Foundation that's in Tennessee. And it's a nonprofit devoted to protecting and caring for bald eagles. Can it get more patriotic than that? I don't think so. <laughs> and other birds of prey who can't take care of themselves. So if you love bald eagles, if you love the eagles, and we're sure that you do, um, please give us your support and pledge to WHYY at WHYY.org. Again, every pledge today will help feed the, the bald eagle who will be soaring around Eagles games or one of that bald eagle's friends, uh, other birds of prey, at that nonprofit uh, in Tennessee. So please help out the birds and help out the station. Right, the American Eagle Foundation in Tennessee. That's right. We're trying to, you know, sort of marry your love of the eagles with your love of WHYY by giving you a little extra added incentive to say, yep, this is really important to me. Having a morning edition on every single morning, uh, weekday morning, uh, hearing Jennifer Lynn and the great NPR and WHYY reporters is so important to me. And I like the fact that I'm going to help feed the birds of prey that have been injured and are being uh, helped and rejuvenated at this uh, at this nonprofit foundation. So lots of reasons to give, but the main reason is because you love WHYY and it's important to you in your life. Please give and give generously at whyy.org or use the app, the WHYY smartphone app, or call 888-345-9499. And we just got a message from Julie, and she's from King of Prussia, and she writes, trying to help meet the challenge. I already donate on a monthly basis. These challenges help motivate me to do more. Grateful for you when I drive. And now we a lot of people
people are grateful for WHYY on their commute. Um, you know, whether that means coming in by bike, train, car, however you get to work, a lot of people are becoming informed, learning about their community through WHYY, and we know that this is an important service. We know that we want to be strong in the future, but the only way we can do it, the only way we can keep shows like Morning Edition going is with more listener support. We have four pledges and a goal of 100. We have a bit to go, but we know that our listeners are very devoted to the cause of public radio. And if you count yourself among them, go to whyy.org right now or call 1-888-345-9499. Do you listen because you want to hear important international news like the discussion we just heard about the, the Middle East uh, and the economy or the this terrible uh, finding in uh, with the Rohingya? Um, or do you listen for stories about state politics, this gerrymandering case that's going on that is so important and will have such a big impact on the next and following elections? Or is it the Eagles that's bringing you to public radio and every day you're hearing stories about how Philadelphia fans are, are gearing up for the big game, whether it's the folks at the art museum or... Um, or people in South Philly, um, or is it the GOP memo that you've been um, interested in hearing about? Or is it all of that? I have a feeling it is all of that. You know that when you tune into Morning Edition every morning, you're going to hear about important and interesting news in the Delaware Valley and around the world. That's why you listen. Today we're asking for you to support it at whyy.org or 888-345-9499. And I mean, you know, listeners are really a part of the public radio process in a way that's not true of other news organizations. When a listener reaches out and says, hey, I love the story that you did, but have you considered this angle? I don't delete that email. I don't delete that voicemail. What I do is call that listener up and try to do a follow-up story. We really try to be responsive to our listeners. We try to do stories that are not not just speaking to the insiders in City Hall and you know people who are, are politically well connected. We try to do stories for everyone across the Delaware Valley, and we have a team of very talented, gifted reporters who are bringing you really interesting stories every single day. But again, those people are completely fueled by the support of listeners like you listening right now. So if so, if you love WHYY, you love NPR. Please show us that. Show us your love. Honestly, the best way to show your love is to go online to whyy.org. And then when you go to parties, when you talk to your family and friends, you can say, I am a member of WHYY. Um, and I think that's a pretty cool thing to be able to show off. The number is 1-888-345-9499. I'm Shirley Min, a reporter for WHYY. I do what I do because I'm an Army wife and have a unique opportunity to share stories about our veterans. Recently, I told a story about the Veterans Watchmaker Initiative in Delaware, a school that teaches the art of watch repair exclusively to veterans. Demand is huge for watchmakers around the world, and vets are perfect for the job. Marine Giancarlo LaRusso is one of six vets in the inaugural class. Now that we're diving into movements for quartz watches, I zone in on the work. I'm in this tiny little world with my loop, and time goes by, it's just an eight hour day, and it, you know, next thing you know, it's, it's over with. On WHYY, you learn about your community. You hear stories that are personal and make you feel something. Your donations make public interest journalism possible. Make your gift today, visiting whyy.org. Thank you. Or you can call 888-345-9499. Lots of reasons to give, as Shirley Min, our Delaware reporter, tells you. I wanted to remind everybody that everybody who gives is getting automatically entered into uh, a chance to win, get this, a trip to the 2018 Masters Golf Tournament, Augusta, Georgia. You've probably seen it on TV. You certainly know somebody who watches it. It's a gorgeous course. It's an important match, obviously. Um, this is two tickets to the two final rounds on April 7th and 8th. Three nights at a hotel, airfare for two. You can get all the details at our website, whyy.org. You give, you get automatically entered into this drawing. You can give at whyy.org and see the details there, or call 888-345-9499. Support for NPR comes from this station and from ProQuest, partners with the USC Shoah Foundation to enable access to the Visual History Archive, for helping students and researchers understand the impact of genocide through video interviews with survivors. Learn more at ProQuest.com. From Heather Sturt Haga and Paul G. Haga, supporting African Wildlife Foundation. 
working to ensure wildlife and wild lands thrive in modern Africa. Learn more at awf.org. From the Epstein Family Foundation, in support of the David Gilkey and Zabiula Tamana Memorial Fund, established to support NPR's international journalists, their coverage, and their commitment to providing the news of the world to audiences back home. And from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You're listening to Morning Edition. I'm Bobby Allen here with Naomi Starobin, and we want to keep WHYY programming undisturbed into the future. We want it to be strong in the coming days, and the only way we can pay our programs forward is with listener support. We know you get a lot from WHYY every time you tune in. Now is your chance to show us that you get a lot out of it by going to WHYY.org or picking up your phone and calling 1-888-345-9499. One of our lovely volunteers will walk you through it. It's very, very easy and quick to become a WHYY member, and we need you now more than ever. WHYY.org. Um, yesterday, we tried to reach a goal of uh, a 1,000 listeners uh, giving by 6 p.m. because uh, that would have allowed us to bring in an extra $40,000 from the Gussick Stein Charitable Trust. They have extended that for us. We didn't quite reach that goal, so we have until 10 o'clock today. Your gift, extra important today. You can really make this happen. Bring in, um, bring in this extra uh, uh, funding that will be put right back toward programming for you. WHYY.org or 888-345-9499. Thanks so much for your support this morning. Please join the thousands of people who support public radio. Life is a quest to resolve humanity's eternal mysteries, and the answers are all around us in culture and creative expression for us to unravel, explore, enjoy, articulate, where life meets art. Tonight at 9.30 on WHYY-TV. Fan Medicine's Heart and Vascular Center supports WHYY. February is American Heart Month, a time to raise awareness about heart disease, the number one cause of death for men and women. Penn Medicine wants you to learn all the risk factors of heart disease today so you can take action tomorrow. To schedule an appointment at one of their community cardiology locations or to take a heart risk assessment, it's penheart.org. That's penheart.org. Supporting WHYY. Focus features presenting Darkest Hour with Gary Oldman as Prime Minister Winston Churchill. As Germany closes in on Britain during World War II, it will take leadership and the power of his words to unite a nation. Now playing. Good morning. It's 7.30. I'm Jennifer Lynn, WHYY News. As Eagles fever grips the Philadelphia region, lots of people are placing all sorts of friendly bets. And WHYY's Annette John Hall reports two learned societies that go back some 200 years are getting in on the wagering. If Benjamin Franklin was alive today, there'd be no doubt he'd be an Eagles fan. He did move from Boston to Philadelphia as a young man. So Franklin would be pleased to hear that the American Philosophical Society the knowledge organization he founded in 1743 placed a friendly Super Bowl wager with its Boston counterpart, the American Society of Arts and Sciences, founded by John Adams in 1780. John Hauser of the American Philosophical Society explains the terms of the bet. What we had put on the line is a book one of the first of three volumes on of writings on the American Constitution by John Adams. And what does APS get if the Eagles win? A set of letters that Benjamin Franklin wrote to a colleague in England describing his early experiments with electricity. So they're very important uh, historic documents and uh, so I surely hope that we will have them on loan for some period of time. Since the mission of both societies is to advance knowledge, APS librarian Patrick Spiro offers this knowledgeable prediction. I've been uh, a Philadelphian for 11 years, and so I watched the Eagles uh, lose uh, several years ago to the Patriots, and uh, I don't think they're going to do it again. They're going to pull this one out. There you have it, from somebody who knows a little bit about history. Annette John Hall. 
WHYY News. Last week, Philadelphia City Council President Daryl Clark challenged Boston City Council President Andrea Campbell to a bet if the Eagles win, Boston has to send local foods to the winner. If the Pats win, Clark has to send some things up north. Yesterday at Reading Terminal Market, Clark expressed his confidence in an Eagles win. Yeah, I've just been told by the members of the Reading Terminal that after we win, we should send the food uh, to Boston anyway uh, to kind of cheer them up. So we'll do that. Among the Philadelphia treats, butter cake, a chocolate-covered onion, and a blend of Philadelphia coffee. Your forecast today, partly cloudy in the morning, increasing clouds throughout the day, a 40% chance of showers this afternoon, a high of 49 at 733. Support for NPR comes from this station and from the Skoll Foundation, partnering with social entrepreneurs and other innovators to confront the world's most pressing problems at home and abroad. Learn more at skoll.org. From Fidelity Investments, taking a personalized approach to helping clients grow, preserve, and manage their wealth. Learn more at fidelity.com slash wealth. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC. And from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, helping NPR advance journalistic excellence in the digital age. This is WHYY's Morning Edition. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Lynn. Every year, thousands of people travel to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania to witness Punxsutawney Phil's weather forecast. If he sees a shadow, it means six more weeks of winter. If not, we get an early spring. WHYY's Ann Danahy embedded herself with Phil's inner circle as they were getting ready for Phil's big day tomorrow. John Griffiths is chopping up vegetables for Phil's lunch. I'm cutting up sweet potatoes, listeners. The groundhog dines in style. Griffith is a handler in what's known as Punxsutawney Phil's inner circle. His duties include everything from preparing snacks for the famous groundhog to handling him on Groundhog Day. Cutting up an apple. Punxsutawney Phil snacks on hand-cut fruits and vegetables and naps on a bed of hay. He and his groundhog wife, Phyllis, live in their own zoo at the town library. Visitors can peer in through an outside window. And turn to Phil and Phyllis for a sneak preview about what will happen tomorrow. Do you want to tell me what you're going to forecast on Groundhog Day? We took that as a filibuster. Griffith said the inner circle does not get inside information either. And you're saying that nobody knows ahead of time what's going to happen? Absolutely not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Griffiths has been a member of Phil's inner circle for about 20 years. As a handler, he works directly with Phil, often sporting a top hat and tuxedo. AJ DeRoom is a newer member of the inner circle. He says Phil is the only weather forecasting groundhog in the world. They like to recognize his stature. As we consider him, he is the king of the animal kingdom. We have to honor him and we do that with the tuxedo and top hats. Phil's inner circle insists the same groundhog has been making the prediction for more than 130 years. The secret, the elixir of life. One sip of the special drink gives Phil another seven years. But what's in it? Griffiths won't say. It's a secret that's been passed down from handler to handler for generations. And another secret is how Phil gets from his home in the library to the big event which takes place at Gobbler's Knob outside of town. Griffiths likes to say Phil is taken by way of secret tunnels to throw off anyone who might be following them. It's like a catacomb down there. The tunnels are unconfirmed. However, Phil travels to Gobbler's Knob. Once he's there, he waits in a hollowed out tree stump for the big moment. At about 7.25 in the morning, the president of the inner circle taps on the door three times. Phil is brought out and it's up to the president to decipher whether Phil has seen his shadow. Griffiths says a cane made from the wood of an acacia tree allows President Bill Dealey to translate Phil's forecast. He doesn't speak to Phil. This is kind of a misnomer going around. He interprets what Phil says through a series of whistles and clicks and any kind of noise that he makes. The prediction, they say, is right every time. Frank Star Lunch co-owner Frank Hetrick says the locals are believers. Oh, absolutely it is true. But are there any non-believers? Oh, uh, there are a few, but they're Patriots fans. We'll find out soon if we're getting six more weeks of winter or an early spring. Either way, Punxsutawney Phil and his inner circle will be ready. In State College, I'm Ann Danahy. Phil the Groundhog and Puxatani.
Tony to eagles flying in the sky in Philadelphia. I'm Bobby Allen here with Naomi Strobe, and I'm here to tell you about a really cool offer, which is if you pledge your support to WHYY today, the station will be feeding the bird. And you wonder, what bird are we talking about? It's an American bald eagle, or another bird of prey, that's being taken care of by this really great organization called American Eagle Foundation. It's a nonprofit based in Tennessee, and they're dedicated to protecting and caring for bald eagles and other birds of prey who can't take care of themselves. When you watch Eagles games and you see that majestic creature soaring above the stadium, who's responsible for protecting and keeping that bird alive? It's the American Eagle Foundation. And with every pledge of support to WHYY today, you will help feed that bird or one of that bird's friends. And I think that's pretty cool. To essentially ask white people where they're really from, Specter says she's not sure what to put down. Where's your family from? Um, how far back? <laughs> um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And before that? Well, before that, according to my grandparents, were Russian and Romanian, but I don't know prior their parents and their grandparents, etc., where they're from. It's a conundrum that many people marking the census box for black or African American may have to face too. They'll also be asked to write in their origins. The Census Bureau did not respond to NPR's questions about why these specific changes were made. But the Bureau has said previously that it's received requests for, quote, more detailed, disaggregated data for our diverse American experiences. And asking about origins on the census is not new, but questions about ancestry have been presented separately from the race question, which may seem like a minor technical detail. But for Peter Farnsworth of Brooklyn, this change gets into personal territory. Don't make me specify what kind of white. If you want to know my race, that's fine, but I don't need to give you details about what kind of white I identify with. Farnsworth says he identifies as American, though his family has ties with England, Scotland, Ireland, and... Nobody ever believes me when I say this, but my <laughs> dad's side of family has lived in Jamaica for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years? Yeah. Elizabeth Grasso, also from Brooklyn, says her ancestors came from Germany and Italy. And being asked to give a more detailed answer about her white identity brings back stories she's heard about her Italian grandparents. There was discrimination against them when they were younger that I, you know, I'm very lucky to not experience now. But there was a time when Italians weren't considered white. At a recent luncheon for seniors at the New York Irish Center, though, many said they support the 2020 census asking white people about their origins, including Martina Malloy of Queens. I always consider myself Irish first and American second. <laughs> which may not be the right thing to say in this country, but that's how I feel. Malloy helped serve slices of pizza to seniors lined up in front of a wall of historical memorabilia, including an old sign that said, help wanted, no Irish need apply. While Malloy is sure about her ancestry, not everyone knows their family history that well. That's why Charles Gallagher, a sociologist at LaSalle University in Philadelphia who studies white identity, says any 2020 census numbers about white origins may not be reliable. If you have a population that's been in the United States for a very long time and people have been, you know, crossing the ethnic line and dating and marrying, people aren't going to have a real accurate record. And he says if you're thinking about mailing out your DNA for testing, beware. So far, the results are not a reliable guide, he says, for how to fill out your census form accurately. Anzi Luang, NPR News, New York. This is NPR News. And this is WNYC. You're listening to Morning Edition. I'm Richard Hake. Good morning. It's 741, 36 degrees overcast right now in New York. Some delays right now on the Long Island Railroad Babylon branch. Other than that, Mass Transit looking okay. We do have a chance of rain, but late this afternoon into tonight. Otherwise, cloudy skies today. Highs near 45 degrees. It'll feel colder with the wind. Rain is likely tonight. It could change over to some snow, and there's a chance of rain and snow tomorrow. Right now, 36 degrees in New York. Support for WNYC comes from Focus Features, presenting Phantom Thread, set in the world of high fashion, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. More at FocusFeaturesGuilds2017.com, now playing in select theaters. This is WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM 820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. From 
NPR News in Washington. I'm Dave Mattingly. The FBI says it has grave concerns ahead of the possible release of a classified House Intelligence Committee memo alleging surveillance abuses by the Bureau and the Justice Department. In Russia, two opposition political activists are facing jail time for social media postings about last weekend's protests in cities across the country. As NPR's Lucianne Kim reports from Moscow, their jail terms are tied to opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Kira Yarmish received five days and Ruslan Shevardinov eight for tweeting about Navalny's calls for an election boycott. Earlier this week, President Vladimir Putin said nobody in Russia should be scared to say what they want on the internet, since the days of Stalinist repressions are long over. Navalny, who was briefly detained at a Moscow rally, says he expects to receive a sentence later that will put him behind bars for the March 18th vote. Police in Los Angeles say the number of homicides in the city dropped 4% last year, as Danielle Carson reports most involved gangs. LAPD data show there were 282 homicides last year. Almost two-thirds involved gangs. Most of the victims and suspects were Hispanic and African American. Police Chief Charlie Beck says gang-related murders are the toughest to solve because, quote, nobody comes forward. He says communities can help if they witness a crime, report it to the police. I'm Dave Mattingly, NPR News in Washington. And I'm Richard Hake on WNYC in New York. Federal prosecutors will not retry Senator Bob Menendez on corruption charges, lifting the legal cloud hanging over the New Jersey Democrat as he gears up for re-election. Prosecutors filed a motion with the court yesterday to dismiss the case after a judge threw out some of the counts last week. Menendez's first trial ended in a hung jury last November. He had been accused of accepting gifts and bribes from a wealthy campaign donor in exchange for political favors. A proposal for a mosque in Bayonne, New Jersey, was rejected last year after a series of heated zoning board meetings. But WNYC's Matt Katz reports that now a mosque will be built in Bayonne after all. The plan to convert a vacant building into a mosque was met with anti-Muslim rhetoric at a series of zoning board meetings. The board voted against the project, citing parking and other zoning issues. Bayonne's Muslims then filed suit last year, alleging discrimination, and now the parties have announced a settlement. The city of Bayonne's insurer will pay $400,000 to the group planning to build a mosque, and another meeting of the zoning board will be held when it is expected to approve the same mosque plan that it previously rejected. A New Jersey town accused of repeatedly discriminating against Orthodox Jewish residents from a neighboring county is agreeing to back down. The town voted to settle with a Jewish group in federal court over its threat to remove Iruz, pipes that form a ceremonial boundary allowing Orthodox Jewish people to move freely on the Sabbath. Mawa Mayor Bill Loforet repeatedly opposed the township council and he says they're not out of the woods yet. While this is a significant move forward for our community, we also face what I consider a very daunting situation with the Attorney General of the state of New Jersey. This town has never been faced with such a lawsuit. The state also sued Mawa, citing the Aruv issue, as well as a law which forbid New York residents from using Mawa parks. That law was seen as a thinly veiled effort to keep Orthodox Jewish people from neighboring communities out of the town. We do have the chance of some rain, but later on this afternoon into tonight, right now 36 degrees. It's Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm Steve Inskey. And I'm Rachel Martin. A few days ago, Pope Francis came to the defense of a Catholic bishop who was accused of covering up Chile's most notorious pedophile priest. The Pope took some criticism for that, and now he's announced he's sending a top envoy to Chile to look into survivors' claims. The controversy has raised concerns that on the issue of clerical sex abuse, the Latin American Pope just does not get it. Here's NPR's Silvio Pajoli. During the flight home from his January visit to Peru and Chile, reporters asked Francis about his support for a Chilean bishop suspected of covering up a pedophile priest, charges the Pope called slander. The most moving was a Chilean journalist, a woman, who with her voice cracking said simply, why isn't the survivor's testimony proof for you? Joshua McElwee, Vatican correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter, says the Pope apologized for causing pain to victims, but then made a murky distinction between the words evidence and proof. For me, it was mystifying to hear the Pope say there's no evidence, but then to also say that the bishop is innocent. The Pope's remarks prompted scathing headlines in leading English-language Catholic media, such as Francis's commitment to abuse survivors in question and Pope Francis's blind spot on sexual abuse. 
Within days, the Vatican announced it would send its top sex crimes investigator, Maltese Archbishop Charles Chicluna, to Chile to study the allegations of a cover-up. But in Italy, media had focused more on the papal apology to victims and not on clerical sex abuse. Gianluigi Nuzzi, author of several books on Vatican scandals, told an Italian radio program. Especially in Italy, since we're right next door to the Vatican. Everything is muted, swept under the rug. There's been nothing close to the cases that shook Ireland and the United States. Having lived in the shadow of the Vatican for some 2,000 years, Italian Catholics can be jaded. It's common for parents who warn their children not to be alone in a room with a priest. And when pedophile cases occur, they're usually hushed up. Societies that have dealt publicly with clerical sex abuse are mostly English-speaking or North European, whose cultures encourage victims to seek compensation. Which is not the case in some other places, like Latin America, Italy, Spain, Portugal, where the victims have been much slower to come forward and speak publicly about this. Robert Mickens is the English editor of the Catholic daily La Croix. Pope Francis is a typical Latin American bishop when it comes to dealing with sexual abuse. He just has not been forced to deal with it. Gerard O'Connell, Vatican correspondent for the Jesuit America magazine, is convinced Francis is determined to eradicate the abuse and the cover-up. But he wonders just how informed the Pope is. It's no secret that there are people with different views inside the Vatican. And they're not on the Pope's page. And some still move with the culture of cover, and yet Francis wants it more 